Wonderful kickoff, and next we're going to learn about uh, kind of coding securely. How many people in here at one point were, would uh, call themselves a, a shitty web developer? Yeah, if you're, if you're not raising your hand, you're lying. Um, so uh, Mr. Johnson here is going to get up here and tell us about some different frameworks that people can use so that they are not nearly as much of a shitty web coder as, uh, as I am or ever was. Let's give him a big round of applause. Did this work? Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, I, at SecEC, there's lots of talks about breaking stuff. Uh, so I figured I'd at least try one on uh, how, to, how to fix some things. Um, so uh, this talks about OWASP, SAM, and actually a lot of other software security assurance frameworks. Um, I kind of go into all of them, um, or well, many of them. Uh, so. Who am I? Why am I here talking to you about that? Uh, my title, I'm a security architect at NetSmart, but really um, kind of the, the body of work that I've been assigned is any code that NetSmart makes, um, any code the company makes, uh, I'm kind of responsible for helping to build it in the most secure way possible. Um, as far as the stuff that I've been working on, uh, or it, my kind of previous companies, um, I've always worked in software departments, but I've never really been a coder myself. Um, I've been kind of software adjacent, um, coder adjacent for a long, long time, and I've been in security for a while too. I've, I've helped to build software assurance programs before, but in NetSmart I really got to kind of build it from the ground up. Um, and so I, I looked at a few different tools and figured I'd pass on some of the knowledge I gained. Um, to this group. So what is uh, software security assurance? Um, it's really, it's a very broad process and uh, some of the frameworks that I go into, they define it differently as well. Um, it's really just anything about software creation and modification and helping to protect the data that the software touches. Um, now that data could be PHI and credit card numbers just like uh, pretty much any app. But it could also be logs or analytics that's based on that data. Um, it could be a lot of different things. So um, kind of this talk is really targeted for a, a lot of different people who are adjacent to um, or uh, they actively develop software. Um, it's not just for developers. Uh, all these frameworks touch people in, say, compliance roles um, or even in operations roles. Um, there, uh, there's plenty of stuff in here um, that a CISO would be um, happy to see. And uh, really even third party testers might be able to um, see kind of some, uh, like a roadmap for a, a client, um, for example, um, on getting their own work more mature. So this is kind of the list of the models that um, I talk about in this. That's certainly not the holistic um, list but uh, is, is anybody in the room using any of these? Anybody, we got any Microsoft SDL people? Uh, <laughs> oh man, um, I'm not sure if I can make that any bigger. Uh, I will take, did that help a little? That's a little All right, all right. Um, so yeah, there's, there's stuff from ISO, NIST, uh, Microsoft SDL is kind of the more, one of the more famous ones, um, and then the BSIM and the OWASP SAM are the two that I'm gonna talk about um, in a bit more depth. So this is a bit of a kind of timeline related to software security assurance. Um, I start this at Bill Gates' trustworthy computing memo. Um, that was kind of a, a really big moment for secure software development when um, he specifically said, uh, security needs to be built in from the beginning of all Microsoft products. Um, and say what you want about Microsoft, uh, certainly, but um, their, their products were like provably better after the implementation of the SDL. Since this is your first time talking at SEC, you get a shot. Thank you. All right, um, yeah, good, good. Uh, so, uh, on this timeline, um, 
There, uh, there was definitely some work right after that. The OWASP SAM and NIST 800 started about the same time. Um, but even though there's a gap there, that was mostly just because I didn't want to fit all the crap that was going on. Uh, these are all active. Um, every single one of those that was on the last slide are active living frameworks um, that are continuing to be developed. Um, they're being added to. So uh, yeah, there's, there's lots and lots going on in kind of the secure software framework um, space. All right, so ISO, basically if you know ISO, you know what to expect. Um, it's a real process-based approach. Um, it heavily relies on an established risk management process. Uh, but really the important thing about uh, 27034 is that it's only like half done. Um, so you can't very realistically adopt this. Um, and it's also the only one of these frameworks that like the content for it is not free. Um, on their website you have to purchase it in Swiss francs. Um, so uh, there is the stuff, there's content out there, um, there's pieces that are in draft, but uh, mostly this one is about half done. So. Um, NIST 800, uh, yeah, you certainly aren't expected to read that on the left there because it is just a giant wall of text, the whole document is. Um, it's pretty hard to read, uh, and it is a little dated. It came out the same time as the iPhone 3G. Um, the, the NIST 800 standard is supposed to only apply to government organizations, um, but I've seen places that are kind of government uh, that work heavily with government organizations adopt NIST standards too, or at least kind of partially adopt them. Um, for all these knocks against it, it actually is a pretty decent uh, standard and it lays things out pretty well. Um, it doesn't really help you build a roadmap as much, uh, but it does have some, um, some heavy controls in place that uh, would help you build pretty secure software. So, not terribly readable, um, but certainly practical. Uh, yeah, this is kind of an example of a chart too. Um, this is like one of the phases. Yeah, don't worry about reading. Um, but you can see that they do have uh, a bit of visualization to help kind of drive the software process through there and where the, where the different checkpoints are. All right, so Microsoft. Um, this is kind of the beginning of many of these software frameworks. The security development life cycle that they've got um, really was the, uh, the genesis of some of these. Um, they, they focused on security, they've got a lot of different security gates specifically within this life cycle. Um, and it's pretty comprehensive and it's definitely living. Um, it, it's not really a roadmap builder though. It doesn't really take you from where you are to where you need to be. Um, and it's, it misses a few pieces compared to some of the other frameworks. Like it doesn't have anything about operations or governance. Um, specifically in there. I mean, there's a little bit about operations on incident response and that sort of thing. Um, but it's, uh, if, you, if you're on a team that works with Microsoft stuff heavily, um, it actually, uh, it wouldn't be a bad one to adopt. They have a, uh, I think they have an agile version of the SDL as well um, that you can kind of adopt that if agile is kind of your, your code management, um, your, your code building process. So the BSIM uh, is one of the ones that I wasn't even aware of before I started doing research in this, but I'm really glad I found. So this is not a security assurance program per se, um, but it's a descriptive view of what other organizations are doing related to security assurance. Um, so uh, really the example is like, um, when you download this PDF, you'll get a little line item that says 80% of surveyed organizations perform external penetration tests, for example. And that's, that's very clear that's in there, that is fact. Um, it is a survey of 109 organizations. I'm gonna list off a few here in a sec. Uh, but it really just, it asks them what portions of security assurance they're, they're doing today. Um, so it's a really, and you can kind of cut them um, by like healthcare or something along those lines to see where your organization compares to um, many others in your field. And that's, that's, those are just great to have, those facts are. Um, so a couple of the example organizations are uh, like NVIDIA, Adobe, Lenovo, Verizon, uh, Splunk, and Cisco, and there's plenty of other big, big names that participate in this. Um, but really all they do is uh, BSIM sends a kind of qualified uh, interviewer to NVIDIA's offices and they just ask a bunch of questions um, and they say prove it um, 
and they do that every year. Um, it said BSIM 8. That's because it's the eighth one they've released. And they started tracking some of these organizations through. Um, so you can actually see uh, one of the really nice things about BSIM. Oh, um, the trend is definitely increased maturity. Um, everybody seems to be improving. Um, now slowly, uh, but it, it certainly is improvement um, over time. Uh, it also is full of cool charts like this. Um, really what this is showing, there's a green circle and a blue circle in this spider chart. The 12 dots around it um, are uh, like the security practices that are measured in the BSIM. And uh, the going outwards towards the chart is more mature. So like this one is a great example. Um, the inside one is healthcare. Healthcare is consistently less mature than cloud, which is the green one. So uh, you can see that like healthcare and cloud are actually pretty close on uh, compliance, for example. And that kind of makes sense. Um, healthcare organizations have had to deal with compliance for a long time. They're pretty heavily regulated. Um, but pretty much everything else, uh, like code review, um, that's one that cloud just, just uh, is like one and a half maturity levels above healthcare um, on average from the surveyed organizations. So you can make some kind of nice, uh, some nice observations about um, your organization compared to the rest of the world um, based on the data from the BSIM. Uh, one of the helpful concepts that the BSIM really defines well is this concept of the software security group. Um, that's just, it's really the, the people in the organization that are responsible for making software secure. Um, and it, my organization, that's pretty much me. Um, but that's gonna kinda, that'll, that'll kinda grow um, over time as more people get trained on these things. Um, and it's just having that kind of really set group of people um, that are responsible for that and it gives like good things like a ratio of how many people in the software security group compared to how many developers that's a ratio that you would think would be um, I don't know you can like try and uh, justify hiring more people based on that for example um, and really everyone struggles too that's one thing that you can see in some of these bigger organizations you think that uh, some of these places really have their stuff worked out um, on average they, they probably don't. So a few of the fun stats from the BSIM. 67% um, of organizations provide awareness training. Uh, that's two-thirds. That's not bad. Um, they definitely could see improvement there. Um, let's see. 25% identify their PII data inventory. Oh, man, that, that number seems very, very low. Um, uh, a couple of these other stats. 48% of organizations educate executives on security stuff specifically. Um, that seems like a pretty low number too since that's a, uh, a thing that would result in turnover. Oh, and 11% have a bug bounty program. Um, and I actually thought that number was higher than I expected. Um, that seems pretty good. And that number is growing uh, as one of the fastest stats um, in the BSIM year over year. So. All right, the OWASP SAM. Um, so that stands for Software Assurance Maturity Model. Um, and its, its purpose really is to help organizations build a program to make software more secure over time. This is kind of a big, uh, this is the structure of it. There's four main business functions, governance, construction, verification, and deployment. And then underneath each of those, there's three security practices. Each of the security practices has its own maturity level, which I guess can kind of start from the implied zero um, all the way up to maturity level three. And these actually map directly to BSIMS 12. Um, so if you look at like the stats on BSIM and you're like, well, nobody else in my, my vector, uh, my, my particular um, silo is that mature on X, um, but we really are, then you do pretty great. Um, so governance is the first of the business functions. There's three sub pieces. Uh, strategy and metrics is really the way that organizations look at business risk. Um, this is kind of uh, a few different things here. Having a roadmap on increasing um, your maturity and uh, aligning it with the business risks um, is what strategy and metrics is generally focused on. 
uh, policy and compliance is kind of how you manage compliance in the organization, um, how you make sure you know when HIPAA changes and you need to um, you need to deal with new things, how you make sure you know when PCI changes. Um, and education and guidance is really just like keeping all of the tools sharp for all personnel that build software. Construction is uh, really about how an organization defines goals and creates software within the development projects. Um, threat assessment is like it, threat modeling. Um, it's making sure you understand who, uh, who would benefit from um, misusing your systems. Uh, and then prioritizing those, uh, those kind of attack vectors um, on, on remediating them. Security requirements is about um, proactively specking out systems to be secure from the beginning. Um, like what is our session timeout? Why is it that uh, that amount? Is it actually a regulation that our session timeout has to be X minutes and not Y minutes? A client asked for that. Those are the types of things that security requirements, having a, a mature security requirements program can help to answer those. We can be like, this is compliant. It can never be longer than 30 minutes. We don't care what the client says. Those are, those are really nice things to be able to say, um, to be able to say quickly based on a mature program. And secure architecture, um, the, the whole point here is kind of like secure by default. When you make a new app, when you add on to an existing app, you want to know that the components that you're collecting together are secure. Um, maybe you shouldn't use PHP, maybe you shouldn't use struts, uh, maybe you should get rid of that old un, uh, unupdated WordPress. Um, those are the types of things that secure architecture really helps to manage. So verification has um, kind of three, all of these have three, but uh, design review is the first. This talks about um, like software attack surface. Um, so you'd actually identify what the different attack points of a piece of software are. And uh, those are the types of things that you can kind of build on. You can say, hey, well, based on our threat models that we identified um, in the last couple of practices, now we have our attack surface. Um, how do those two kind of go together? Um, data flow diagrams are something that kind of uh, is a result of having a, a good design review process. Implementation review is basically code review, um, and I'm going to go into deep dive in a couple of slides on what implementation review is. Um, but security testing is kind of the, the external, the black box stuff. This is running uh, Zap or W3AF against your, um, against your apps and uh, maybe having automated tests because your, your QA organization uses automation, um, having ones that specifically exercise the security features in potentially malicious ways. Um, really, the, this is kind of, all of these, there's kind of a common refrain as you gain maturity. You really, you start small, you start really basic, um, and then you kind of add automation, and then it's, then you enforce the rules uh, that you've helped to define. <coughs> And the last business function is operations. Um, issue management is really incident response. Uh, that's one of the key pieces of this, um, but it's specifically incident response in the context of your applications, um, the applications that your, your company uh, creates. So it's really about consistency, communication, um, having a solid disclosure process. Those are the types of things that issue management starts to lay out for you. Um, and then environment hardening is just uh, patching and monitoring. Um, this is uh, one that is, is uh, difficult, but um, I, I do a deep dive on that one here in a second too. Operational enablement is really about the communication between the dev teams and the operators of the actual software. So um, a great example here is like an installation guide um, that you know that all these config items are available um, for, the, for the software and you know very clearly how those make the application behave. That the application does support 2048-bit keys, but the default is 1024 or something like that. Those are the types of things that um, are, in, uh, are in this documentation and are very clearly communicated between the actual developers and the operators, um, whether that be uh, 
the clients themselves or if you're a cloud operation or something like that. Um, code signing is um, a kind of a maturity level three thing here where if you get really solid, if you get a great code signing process, um, that makes life easier, but you kind of have to build up to it. So I'm gonna do a deep dive for, for three of these security practices and kind of take you through the idea of uh, going from maturity level zero to maturity level three. Each of these maturity levels, they offer um, a bunch of different things, uh, but activities are kind of one of them. Uh, so education and guidance, maturity level one is, um, it's two basic things. It's technical security awareness training and building and maintaining technical guidelines. Um, so to really meet EG1, you have to define how your organization would see those are met um, based on a set of metrics. And then you actually have to do it, um, which that's usually the hard part. But uh, to start with, these are usually not that tough. So technical security awareness training, depending on where your bar is, depending on what your organization is, this could be sending everybody out to watch some YouTube videos. Um, it could be a more complicated like half day training um, and building and maintaining technical guidelines. That could just be a wiki or a, a, a link to OWASP and um, some specific guidance on that. So. Uh, each of these also offers a costs estimate, um, and this isn't like a dollar figure, um, but it's like a licensing is the cost you have to think about for this one. Um, the time that someone would take developing training content is one of the things you'd have to think about. Um, and that's, those are available for every single one of these maturity levels too, which is really nice. Um, education and guidance maturity level two is a role specific training. So that means a project manager might get security training, but it would be different than the security training for a developer. It'd be different than the security training for a BA. Um, it'd be very role specific to their part of the software life cycle. It also has a concept of security coaches. Um, the idea that the SAM has here is that uh, say like an architect level developer gets 10% of their time dedicated to security consulting. Um, and they would then, uh, they take extra training to be able to be like a secure developer. Um, but then that time, uh, they kind of float around various different projects in the organization um, and be consulted with uh, for, uh, to make all those pieces of software better. And education and guidance level three, this is like the top level. Um, you've got a role-based examination or certification. So like at NetSmart, for example, this would be, uh, you are a certified secure uh, senior developer or something along those lines. Um, and that means they've taken an examination, they've completed uh, certain amounts of training, whatever we really decide that is, um, but they, they'd be certified. Um, and maybe if we have a particularly sensitive project, um, we might say we have to have a certified architect and a certified developer on this project at all times. Um, but that certainly would make the, the project better and make everybody feel a little bit better about that. Um, and it, part of the reason why I'm going into these is because you can't really just skip to maturity level three. Um, each of those really builds on every single one before it very well. Um, and the, the SAM, the content for it, uh, shows kind of how that is. Um, and even the, the metrics that you measured at level one, like just plain old security awareness training, those are something that you measure at each level again. So they're, they're totally additive. Uh, EG3, uh, Education and Guidance Maturity Level 3, is one plus two plus all, everything for three as well. Implementation review um, is, uh, code review is kind of the, the foundation of this. Um, and really level one is, uh, it, it's two pretty basic bullet points. Um, it's number one, you've got a checklist of here's things you should look at when you're reviewing code. Um, and that can be simple. I mean, you can find 10 examples of this on OWASP. Um, and then number two, it's that you point review high risk code. Um, and that you're gonna show you've done that. And it, that's usually not that high of a bar for dev teams. And that's, that's great. Um, both of those things are pretty easy to implement. Uh, and I, I guess that many dev teams are already doing that. Um, so that means a lot of dev teams are already implementation review certified level one. Um, it depends on exactly how you set your metrics and you measure that, um, but that's kind of what they are. Level two is using automated code analysis um, and making that a key part of the development process. 
and uh, there's uh, the documentation has a little thing they say like accomplishments of IR2. So if you are IR2, these are the nice little bullet points you can send off to leadership. You can say that development is enabled to consistently self-check for code level security vulnerabilities and stakeholders are aware of unmitigated vulnerabilities to support better trade-off analysis. Um, those are kind of the real goals of uh, implementation review level two. And you should be able to say, yes, we do all of these things um, when you've completed that. Level three um, is just a bit of customization of your automation um, that you've already implemented. A release gates, so an example would be um, no new high vulnerabilities from static analysis or no high vulnerabilities from static analysis. Those are the types of things that you would uh, implement here. And uh, yeah, so like a success metric for level three is um, say, 75% of projects are passing a code review audit in the past six months. So that means you have to figure out the number of projects, you have to audit some of them, and then you have to figure out whether they pass or not. Um, and that could be lots of different things, um, the, the actual audit itself, but that's kind of the number that it rolls up to. Um, and if you met those types of success metrics, you would be IR3. Environment hardening, um, this is really just management of your hosts that are running your software. Uh, for cloud organizations, this is pretty important. Um, patching, monitoring, uh, tools like SCCM and Puppet are really gonna be the ones uh, that come into play here. Um, and really, you just wanna make sure your environment is healthy. So, uh, level one for this is like having active, or having real documentation um, for what the technology stack is for running your software on these hosts. Um, that's uh, that's tougher than you might think, um, but yeah, documentation is certainly a piece that's uh, usually kind of thrown by the wayside when you're just trying to get something to work. Um, security updates to third-party components starts to kind of come into play here as well. Uh, how many old jQuery versions are referenced in your site? Uh, that might be kind of an issue. Um, two really makes environment hardening a routine process that you are monitoring against a baseline, um, you actually have a process to take hosts out of a non-compliant status and pull them back into compliance, um, and you have formal expectations for that. And then three is really just you have an audit program. Um, you know different tools. Uh, one of the interesting things that you'll get to in um, environment hardening three is that uh, you specifically have like talk back and forth between developers and operations folks. like. Hey, we've got these F5s. These F5s do all kinds of really awesome WAF stuff um, that might be able to help your software. So then the developers are thinking about that when they build it. And the devs and the ops guys are talking. Um, that means you've got a more secure product. Uh, that means you're leveraging a, a bunch of functionality from, say, the F5s, which you might not be able to do before. Um, you might just kind of turn them on and say, please work. Um, so that's uh, those are some of the great benefits from having a really mature environment hardening security practice. Um, so based on all that, really what is the SAM? Um, it, it's a 72 page PDF. Um, it, the, the website, the OWASP website has a wiki on it as well uh, that most of the data is on, um, but the, the PDF actually has a little bit more data, um, which is kind of nice and a, a bit better stuff on it. So I've been like control Fing around this big old PDF for a while. Um, and it is, it, it's still very usable. Um, there's a uh, there's an Excel document that assists with assessing yourself. Um, the idea is like the Excel document has a bunch of questions, um, and then it kind of has this drop down for answers. And based on those answers in your organization, it will give you a maturity rating. Um, so you can go home and test yourself, or well, not go home. Um, but you can uh, say, well, I think we do security awareness training. Um, so you can say, oh yeah, yeah, uh, most of our devs get security awareness training. And that'll get you like halfway to maturity level one. Um, so uh, there, there's a few different tools out there, uh, but mostly it's just content in like long form. Um, and it really is, uh, it's surprisingly usable even in that form. It's not just a big wall of text. There's lots of great charts. Um, there's lots of great organization. Um, So the self-assessment is really one of the first things you do implementing the SAM. 
this is basically asking different people from around the organization different questions. The, uh, uh, there have been very few organizations that I've been a part of that I've been able to ask like one person all of the different questions for this life cycle. Like, hey, do we perform, uh, do we check HIPAA every year to make sure nothing's changed in the context of our organization? Um, and also, do we patch our servers? Um, like, usually that's different people that answer those questions. Um, so, you interview a few different people based on their domains that they can answer, um, and you kind of fill that out in the assessment on based on what you think, and um, this little document here, uh, this is just a screenshot, um, but it'll give you a, a little number over there on the right of where it thinks your maturity level is for, this is education and guidance number one. Um, so you're, you're part way there. Um, that's the type of thing that you can really, uh, you can get there. So eventually you get to results, um, and it'll kind of look like this. So you can see that, say, for policy and compliance, you have a bunch of partials. Um, you're partially there for maturity level three. Uh, on issue management, you're partially there for maturity level three. But on secure architecture, like, you got basically nothing. So you can take that information and you can kind of start to feed it into your roadmap process. Um, oh, there's, there's a self-assessment detail, which is basically the same thing. It goes into it, but really all it is is proving the fact that uh, you answered those questions or not. Proving the fact that you did have 75% of developers actually take training. Um, and the self-assessment, the detailed self-assessment, that's what you'll perform at the end of every phase um, to prove that you have actually made it to the next maturity kind of milestone that you meant to. Um, so it's, it's like an audit, um, but it's ever, everybody's internal, so it's a little friendlier than the normal audit. So a roadmap, you build it. Um, on these, you can kind of see, like the first one, you ramp up a little bit early. Uh, so in phase one, you ramp up to maturity level one, but then you kind of skip a phase. You just let it sit at level one, and then you go all the way up to level three towards the end. Um, down here in this bottom one, uh, this one, you, you just skip level one, uh, you skip phase one totally, and you don't even end at level three, too. That's one thing about the, the SAM um, and building your own roadmap is like, you don't have to get to maturity level three. It just might not be right for your organization. Some of these things uh, just are not going to be as important for your specific organization as they would be for everybody else. Um, and that's a really great thing that the SAM is built to be very flexible. It's built to work around your organization's needs um, and you build your own roadmap. It just kind of offers some guidance. Uh, another thing that I kind of ran across during this is that you can usually align to what's in flight already. Um, you know that in the next six months uh, you're going to get like a new SIM product in place um, and it's going to offer these two or three features that you don't have already. The SAM talks about using a SIM um, in some of your uh, issue management. Um, so you can kind of slot that in there. Um, you can make sure you implement the SAM, uh, or the, the SIM tool, <laughs> it's very confusing, um, the SIM tool in a, in a good way that aligns with how the SAM does. And maybe it reminds you that you forgot to, oh hey, um, we forgot this other thing up here uh, that's kind of a prereq that, that having a good issue management program would really help to build on. So some examples of building a roadmap. Um, like a larger organization that still uses kind of like the waterfall development method, you've got uh, long, long dev cycles. Um, you write a piece of code and it's 60 days or 90 days before it ever hits prod. Those are the types of organizations that a much longer um, phase length, uh, which is one of the main things for building a roadmap. Um, uh, that, that makes a lot more sense in those. Um, really, I don't see any good reason to use any phase length other than either three months or six months. Um, because those can align to your fiscal year, which usually makes a difference. Um, so that you know, you can kind of plan a little bit. Uh, I know that these costs are coming up based on security assurance um, and uh, they're aligned with fiscal year stuff. Um, the, the phase length is really how often do you want to audit the activities that you've done. And then the, the content specifically within those phases is kind of how you, you manage it past that. Um, so 
say a, a monolithic resistant to change organization, um, they might do six month phases, and they might do six of them because they know that it's gonna be pretty slow um, and not throw a whole lot of content in each phase. Um, but a, a smaller organization, and a more agile organization, um, one that everybody's really jazzed about security, just so excited. Um, you might do three month phases, um, and you might only do four. You might just be like, by the end of this year, we are gonna be 100% secure. Uh, so really, you've gotta like set metrics. Um, that's how you measure that you go from one phase to the next. Um, and setting metrics is, uh, it's a bit more subtle than you'd like to think, um, than you'd think. So the SAM offers a lot of example metrics that you'd use. So um, a great example, so for strategy um, level three, you'd use, or one of the metrics is like 80% of projects reporting security costs in the past three months. Well, that means you have to know what a, a project is very clearly, um, and sometimes that's a bit of a blurry line. Um, and you have to be able to measure all of them. And then you also have to have some sort of infrastructure to be able to build back to the security department. Um, so these, these get pretty complicated um, when you set these metrics, but they all really need to be measurable. Um, like the, the, the issue that I run into is like who is a developer and who's not? Um, who is a developer, who's not? Uh, that's the type of thing that really, um, it, it's kind of hard to define sometimes because there's people that write code that don't have developer in their title. Um, there's there's architects, there's there's managers sometimes that write code. And so do all of the same things apply to them? Um, that might be security training. Uh, they, these are complicated questions that you really do have to answer. It's not just like, oh, there's an AD group for this, put a little check, bar, um, check, check box next to their name when they've performed their test. And then once you exit, or when you get to the point where you're executing your roadmap, yeah, the phase length is really uh, one of the pieces that you've got to pick. Um, and then when you start, of course, uh, aligning with, with fiscal year is my, my suggestion. Um, I'd also say once you start to build a roadmap too, really only get a lot of detail out based on the phase that you're in. Um, so you start at phase one, get a lot of detail in phase one, you, you know what you're gonna accomplish um, six months from now at the end of the phase, but don't really worry about phase two. Um, it's just not important right now because you're probably gonna miss something in phase one, it's probably gonna roll over. You're gonna realize that your measurements were all just screwed up for that, that a count of vulnerabilities is not a number that, that um, is the right way to measure things. Um, and, and you'll have to roll those over. Um, and that's fine, uh, the, the framework allows for that really well, it, it certainly supports it. Okay, so you completed your roadmap, you are now totally secure, you built this great, great process, um, what now? So after you've completed that, a lot of these maturity levels, they actually kind of have these ongoing, uh, ongoing activities that you, you audit your code review processes every six months, um, and you make sure that people are code reviewing uh, as they should. Um, and really, tech changes too fast to really ever be done with this type of thing, too. Um, so even if you have all these controls in place, you're gonna throw them out the window once AI starts writing your code anyways. Um, it'll be like, well, is this code gonna kill me? That's the type of thing that you'll have to deal with then. So in practice, some of my observations, um, the output of this process has really been pretty polished. Uh, everything that has come out of this, um, I, I would be happy, it, it's like pretty easy to make a PDF um, or a, a PowerPoint or whatever that you'd show to your execs. Um, it's high quality stuff, uh, the wording is right, it's very comprehensive as well, um, and it's certainly polished. Uh, and that's, it, it also seems like, I mean more importantly, it seems like a solid roadmap to get us from uh, where we are um, to really where we aspire to be, which is great. So the, the call to action. Um, you guys want to get started? Really, I, I might actually suggest starting with the BSIM and just go in and download that from the BSIM, uh, I think it's bsim.com or something like that. Uh, download that, check it out, try and figure out based on those survey results, based on those percentages, um, where your organization would fit in. And then it, you can kind of bring that up. Um, maybe you get a little bit of traction around trying to improve some of those numbers because you realize you're, you're two levels behind a lot of the other places uh, 
in, or a lot of the other companies in your, your silo. Um, then at that point, you can start to maybe pull down the SAM, um, try and have a good idea of what you need to get to a maturity level. Maybe take that survey, um, start off with the, the assessment um, where you ask people a few questions, you fill these things out, you say, uh, we, we, get, we do um, security training for our devs, but it, it's basically the same security training everybody else gets, like don't click on links and emails, that sort of thing. Um, so I don't think that really qualifies, blah, blah, blah. You go through there, um, you figure out that uh, you've got a couple of them that are maybe maturity level one and most of them that are not, and you can really start from there. That's kind of building your roadmap. Um, so the tools are all free, they're all totally available, they're really easy to get to, um, and I, I would highly suggest uh, adopting these if, if you're possibly in an organization that you can, that you can do that. Um, that's pretty much it for my presentation. Uh, what do we got for questions? Yep. So let me see if I, I heard all that. Um, so it was, uh, you asked about, oh yeah, I, I mentioned problems getting traction, and you asked about maybe getting the champions to help uh, leverage that as well. So um, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. Uh, security champions are people that uh, they're usually the, the higher level developers in the organization, um, or not necessarily developers, but people that are very technically skilled. Um, so really the issue there is that, honestly, their, their dance books are already full. Um, their dance card's full. So uh, you've got to get the, I mean, the, the number one important thing um, for any security organization is like uh, executive support, is management support, I mean, making the whole thing work. Um, and so if you get that and you can get a, a developer's time, a smart developer's time, um, you get him a little bit of stuff and he'll be like, yeah, I'll be your champion 100%. Um, that's usually the case and that's certainly something that you can do um, in an organization that's really open to that. So, yeah, that's that's a great idea. Um, get everybody to work for you. <laughs> Instead of doing the work yourself, <laughs> so it totally works. Anything else? All right. Thanks, everybody.